Right after Free League announced that they would be doing an officially licensed Walking Dead RPG, I didn't think much of it. I figured they would use their much loved Year Zero engine rule set for it and it would be decent. But when I took a closer look at how the game was being branded, with this awkwardly named universe at the end and all these AMC logos everywhere, I got concerned that maybe Free League was losing its way, and I made a whole video about it. And then that led to a written interview with head guy Thomas Harnstam, in which he told me that Free League has pretty much almost always done licensed games since day one of their company, and they only pick up licenses if they have writers who are passionate about those IPs. So I backed the game on Kickstarter at the digital level and waited about six months, which is Free League's average turnaround time from crowdfund to fulfillment, and got the game and immediately read through it. And I've got to say, the actual name of the game is still kind of cheesy to me, but I mostly blame the AMC lawyer or junior exec who stipulated that it include the word universe in it as well as the company's logo. But the game itself is incredibly well presented and fleshed out. Yes, it is a game that is clearly inspired by the violent, psychodramatic story that is The Walking Dead, really most specifically that original show and not the spinoffs, but it's also a game that can stand on its own. If you stripped away every written reference and character illustration in the book that references AMC's The Walking Dead, you'd be left with a game that was 99% intact, and that game would be called Year Zero Engine Zombies, which is also a terrible title and one that would have raised one tenth of the funds that the licensed title raised. So in the end, Free League does IP games and they used The Walking Dead both as an inspiration and as a marketing tool to sell their game. Once you're at peace with those relatively harmless facts, then you wade past them and enjoy what is a pretty remarkable zombie role-playing game. One that, for me personally, seems to hit a lot of the things I've also been missing in zombie RPGs. So let's jump right in and see what this game is all about. So the first thing that the book tells you is that you can play anywhere within the timeline of the Walking Dead franchise. I've only watched the original show, so I couldn't tell you how much variability there is in the timeline itself. I guess the biggest variable would be how many years since the fall of civilization have passed. If it's just one year, then you'll run into a fair number of fresh-faced survivors and fresh cans of food. If it's 10 years, then all of humanity will have hardened and fully factionalized. The game's creators present two game modes, campaign mode, where you play several or many sessions, and survival mode, which is meant to be a one or two session adventure with fairly predetermined factors. This core rulebook includes one example campaign layout and one survival scenario. And the starter set, which I'm not really covering in this video, contains one survival scenario. I thought the principles of the game here were pretty important to note. Do whatever it takes to survive. Death is inescapable, aka zombies are everywhere. You are never safe. You are not alone. You are telling a story, or in other words, skip the boring parts and focus on the fun scenes. And fiction comes first, or put the characters and their experiences and development first, if it's a toss up between that or something boring or anticlimactic that the rules dictate. I thought this was a bit awkward here. The authors are calling advantage and disadvantage where you roll two dice and take a higher or lower roll respectively, double high and double low. I mean, technically it's single high or single low and the word double just refers to the number of dice thrown but whatever. There is almost no discussion of the lore of The Walking Dead here, and I kind of appreciate that. The cause of the zombie outbreak and the response by governments and militaries and all of that is just completely left out. You're in the dark as much as the survivors are in the setting, which is cool because it means that you and your players can create and discover their own truths about AMC's The Walking Dead universe from AMC. That being said, there are some zombie rules in this universe. All zombie franchises have specific rules about zombies, and this one is no exception. Rule number one, all walkers are single-mindedly focused on feeding. Rule number two, the only way to kill a walker is to destroy its brain. Rule number three, bite or scratch from a walker will lead to immediate infection and death within a few days at most. The only way to avoid this is to amputate the injured part of your body immediately after being bit or scratched. Rule number four, you will wake up as a zombie if you die with your brain intact. Could be minutes or a number of hours. Rule number five, walkers have poor eyesight but really keen hearing and smell. 
Oof, that's enough of that. Creating a character in this game should be completely second nature to you if you've played any of Free League's previous RPGs, which use their Year Zero engine, which is almost all of them. Here is the list of things you need to choose. Since the creators really want to simulate the psychodrama of the shows, they really want you to keep these three things in mind. Your character's issue, their drive, and their relationships to other PCs and NPCs. The GMs also need to keep those factors in mind when prepping a session or campaign so that they can design so-called challenges, because challenges are the driving force of the action and the story in this game, and it doesn't always come from combat with zombies and survivors. A lot of this game does focus on your mental stability, or lack thereof, mostly because that was a major running theme in the original Walking Dead TV show, people just buckling under the constant stress of a zombie apocalypse. These specific triggers, or breaking points here, mean that a player has to roll their wits or empathy to see if they've managed their fear. And if they don't get a six, they roll on this overwhelmed table and either shuffle up their PC's driver issue, or there's a 50% chance here of becoming shattered. And that's not a random result so much as it's something you choose which fits the fiction. As you can imagine, picking up just two or three of these shattered attributes for a PC can wind up making them pretty shell-shocked and maybe even unpleasant to play as or with. That's a perpetual risk, actually, with RPGs that try to simulate deep manifestations of mental unhealth. It may not always be so fun at the table. Experience points work like they always do in your Zero Engine games. At the end of each session, you ask a few basic questions and award one XP each for each question answered in the positive. There are two things here I want to note. One is that the authors actually mixed it up a bit and made a few of these questions more interesting than the standard generic XP questions you always see. And that's a nice thing to see because once you play enough Year Zero Engine games, these generic questions, you realize, are just not meaningful or interesting, and they don't push or prod the players to do things that would enhance their own gaming experience or the story in any way. The second thing is that this dearly departed monologue question is particularly inspired because it encourages one player per session to make a short speech about an NPC or PC who died in a previous session and can lead to up to six XP in one shot. There are 12 archetypes in the game and they each come with a key attribute and key skill that can start higher than normal. And you choose one archetype specific talent out of three to start with. I have the complaint here as I do with all of the Year Zero games that Free League publishes, and it's that they present a handful of options for each archetype that are usually so generic that they should be consolidated into a big rollable table that can be applied to any archetype. You can see here that these issues, drives, and relationships for a criminal type can really just be for any type, and same for the doctor. They will probably never abandon this way of presenting archetypes, unfortunately, but the workaround is to tell your players at character creation that they can choose an issue driver relationship from any of the archetypes. It's a little more page flipping and much harder to randomize, but that's what we've got to work with. Anyway, you have the criminal, the doctor, the farmer, the homemaker, and all of these types, by the way, have shown up in the TV shows in one form or another, of course. The kid and the law enforcer. I do love that Free League always manages to have a kid as an archetype in almost all of their games. And of course, you have Tales from the Loop and Things from the Flood, which are all kids. The nobody, the outcast, the politician, the preacher. And finally, you have the scientist and the soldier. And by the way, if you're wondering what really distinguishes these archetypes from each other, it's the type-specific talents more than anything. We'll look at that whole list of talents in a minute. If you're not familiar with the Year Zero engine, by the way, the basic mechanics of your character are based on these four core attributes, strength, agility, wits, and empathy, as well as 12 skills organized under the four stats, and a small handful of talents and gear which can add bonuses. In the event that you need to roll to resolve an attribute or skill check, you roll one or more d6s, depending on how many points you have in the associated attribute and skill, if you have any points in a skill that applies. Any sixes that you roll are considered successes, and most checks only require one success. There are two major things that can complicate a normal roll as described. The first is that you can push a roll, which means you can re-roll any non-successes. When you do this, you take one stress point and add a stress die to the re-roll. The second thing is the stress dice themselves. Over the course of play, your PC will pick up stress points, such as from these occurrences. 
If you'll notice, stress is coming at you constantly, and for every point of stress you take on, it enhances your rolls because you get to add a d6 for every point. But if you roll a one on any of these stress dice, bad things happen. The book here calls it rolling a walker, and they continue to call it that for the rest of the book. Okay, they actually also call rolling a one messing up, so we can call it that too, I guess. Anyway, messing up can play out in the fiction in many different ways, and this is one of the many places in the game where GM experience can really come in handy. Creative and story forward GMs are going to come up with really interesting consequences for messing up. And speaking of clever GMs, I think the most effective ones who are running Year Zero engine games are ones who are able to create situations that employ all 12 of the skills in the game. If you're not careful, you can end up in a session where players are kind of rolling the same few skills over and over. You can see this with the survival skill, for example, where players could end up just having to roll it over and over since it accounts for tracking peoples and animals, scavenging for food and resources, and tracking down specific items. But okay, talents. Like I mentioned a minute ago, the one thing that really distinguishes the 12 archetypes is their unique talents. For example, the doctor's talents here include a plus two to medical skill checks when stabilizing basic critical injuries. And the law enforcer's talents include moral compass, where when you put yourself in danger to stand up for what's right, you shed one stress point. I do find that these talents are really unbalanced in terms of how frequent they can be used and how generally useful they are. For example, moral compass is really incredibly potent because your character is probably standing up for what's right all the time. And so this is a constant source of stress relief. But most of these talents are super specific, like the farmers living off the land. Gain plus two to tech when you work on projects that increase capacity for your haven. We haven't covered havens yet, but basically that is a role that might happen once per session. The general talents are a different story. And by the way, you can pick any of these talents for 10 XP each, so roughly once every two sessions after the first session. But yeah, these general talents almost all have a solid mechanical punch to them you'll have a hard time choosing from this list because they're almost all really helpful. This game introduces the concept of duels, where two non-zombie characters roll opposed skills and whoever has the most successes wins, and if there's a tie, then both characters inflict damage on each other. Pretty straightforward. Then there are brawls, which is a multi-character fight amongst non-zombies. I won't get too into it, but the gist is that it follows six general phases, as seen here. As far as damage, you always start with three points of health, and if you lose all three, you are considered broken which means you're down and can't do much except crawl around and say a few words. Anytime you reach broken status, you have to roll on the critical injuries table, and that's where your problems really begin. Critical injuries are randomized, which can really conflict with the fiction at your table, and I didn't see anywhere where the book reconciles this potential issue. But yeah, when you reach broken status, you roll on this table and actually have a one in eight chance of just dying on the spot. And a lot of the injuries are lethal if you don't treat them in hours or minutes. And until you do, either with basic or advanced medical gear, depending on the A or B denoted here, then you suffer a penalty to all rolls, as noted in this column. I don't think I'm opposed to the harshness of this table, but again, the randomness of it plays a little recklessly with the narrative that it is injecting itself into. Do you remember the fiction comes first language we saw at the beginning of the book? I'd really take that to heart here. You do not want to be in the middle of an interesting character or story arc and then have your player attacked by a single walker, go broken, then roll a pierced heart on this table and have to roll up a new character. That would be no good, so maybe cherry pick the critical injuries. One thing that really jumped out at me was how much stress you can relieve in a certain way. If you have normal social interactions with another character, you relieve one stress, and that's nice. But if you meet with your anchor, who is like your designated best buddy for an hour or more, then you relieve all your stress. So the game has the duel and brawl rules, but that's for fighting other living humans. When it comes to fighting walkers, it's a different set of rules. Walkers have almost no mechanical characteristics. They don't even have hit points. Instead, they are described in terms of their appearance and their head count. And even their head count is abstracted to one of six swarm size ratings. Each room or specific situation in this game has an assigned threat level, which is rated from zero to six. PCs can increase the threat level by doing things like rolling a one on a stress die, or just failing a skill roll, or making too much noise. 
and the GM has to track threat levels by room or area. Unfortunately, if the party splits up, the GM has to then keep track of threat levels for individual groups, which could be a lot to juggle. At threat level one or two, you actually have a chance of sneaking around walkers, either with stealth or mobility, or maybe another skill if you're clever. But at level three or more, you can't avoid them. Also, there's no direct way to reduce the threat level. As far as actually being attacked by a walker, when it does happen, it all comes down to a single roll, one skill roll, whichever skill makes the most sense in the fiction. If you succeed, you kill the walker. If you fail, you roll on this table. And this table, just like the critical injuries table, can be kind of problematic due to its randomness. At the bottom end, you may pick up one point of stress or one damage. But depending on your roll, you could end up with two points of damage or three damage, which means that if you're without armor, that's you being broken in almost all cases. If you're bitten, you're dead in D6 days. And some of these entries have you dead instantly. I just don't know how I feel about that. I guess if you want to play this game rules as written, you probably need to ask every player to bring a backup PC to the session and warn them not to get too attached to any of the characters. Facing off against a swarm of walkers is actually abstracted down to one roll as well. If the threat level is three or more, then you pick three PCs and NPCs from your party and they each roll whichever skill they want. Then you add up all the successes from those rolls and they need to meet or exceed the swarm threat. If the swarm threat level is three, then you get away. If it's level four, five, or six, then the collective roll just reduces that level down by one. If you fail this roll, then the GM can do one of these three things. There are a few other bits and pieces here, but that's pretty much it. I really appreciate the elegant simplicity of these rules. On the face of it, trying to design mechanics for something as chaotic as facing a swarm of zombies whose numbers range from five to a thousand seems daunting. But in year zero engine fashion, I think they pulled off a pretty approachable and serviceable solution here. Havens are something that all PC groups have and they're the home base that you can always return to. They can be anything from an abandoned bus to a gas station to a boarded up mall, but each have two main mechanical features. Their capacity, which is an abstract representation of how much in resources they currently have, and their defense, which can afford a bonus to the role when being attacked. One of the things I loved most about Havens is not only the fact that each one starts with at least one issue or one major problem that you have to contend with, but at least one secret issue as well. Take a look at this list of example issues and tell me it wouldn't be fun as the GM to spring one of these Haven issues on players at the worst possible time. Players can also improve the capacity or defense of their Havens through projects, which will take either days, weeks, or months. But rather than a short list of eight examples here, I would have loved to have seen a full exhaustive list of project options. I guess with enough study of this table, you can come up with your own. Going on runs in this game is where the grid crawl mechanics kick in. Actually, that might be overstating the amount of mechanics here. You make progress on a map by simply heading out either on foot, mount, or vehicle, and each character needs to consume one ration per day or they start to starve. You can spend a day scavenging or hunting, and you would simply resolve that with a survival roll. I'm not going to cover the GM section of this book, but I'll note that I think it's very closely tailored to the game at hand, as opposed to written generically and copy-pasted from a previous Year Zero Engine book. Here's a really telling passage in the GM section that informs you of what kind of RPG this is trying to be. Look at this list of questions that you as the GM should be asking about each PC. This is a game of psychodrama and human relations as much as it is fighting and surviving zombies. And it's not just your relationships with fellow survivors immediately around you, but interactions with other groups of survivors, which are going to create some of the most interesting moments in the game. In fact, take a look at this spread that helps you create your own NPC faction. The book doesn't have anything like this for zombies, Walkers are just walkers, but factions have leadership structures, needs, assets, issues, and havens. One other thing worth noting is that the GM is meant to plan sessions not by lining up a railroad of issue and solution, but rather come up with a list of challenges and sub-challenges for players, and only players, to solve. The game comes with a worksheet that spells out where to write these challenges, as well as all the other components of a session. I feel that this is a very enlightened and modern approach to running an RPG where the GM is meant to make situations rather than storylines. 
I'm also going to sort of gloss over the solo play rules here, but this section runs 10 pages and addresses virtually every aspect of the game in the framework of playing alone. As with most solo game applications, this could very easily serve as a creative writing tool if you aspire to create a compelling zombie survival tale or, heaven forbid, Walking Dead fanfiction. All right, here are my thoughts on AMC's The Walking Dead Universe AMC role-playing game. Goofy title. I'm beating a dead horse here. I just don't like the name of this game. Randomness is harsh. The very high potential to suddenly and definitely die when you lose three hit points or get attacked by a single walker is antithetical to the game's fiction first philosophy. But if you believe in that philosophy, then just don't roll on those particular tables. Pick from them instead. Walkers are always walkers. This is a feature of the graphic novel and TV shows and not really the fault of the game designers, but there is pretty much no mechanical variation in the zombies. So after a few sessions, zombies could get kind of boring. You actually see this phenomenon in the show where the walkers in the first couple seasons serve as one of the primary threats to the protagonist. But as the show went on, the writers seemed to have lost interest in making the walkers a major element, and they became relegated to a few action set pieces here and there, and would occasionally crop back up as the primary problem in people's lives. This is a natural result of not being allowed to have fundamentally different types of zombies. But again, that's the nature of the underlying setting created by Robert Kirkman. It's all sort of grounded in realism. Walkers are just walkers. So that same feature that makes zombies boring after a while because they only come in one flavor is also a pro in my opinion because it refocuses the game on human relationships and interplay between human factions. If you have a zombie game where, for example, you could generate all kinds of crazy zombie archetypes with different powers and point pools, then the game would naturally focus more on combating those monsters which would detract from the intensity of the psychological landscape that you're meant to play on. Elegant new mechanics. Aside from the always welcome simplicity of the year zero engine rules, the new rules for threat levels, walker attacks, and swarm attacks is effective enough to be able to narrate the scene, but about as simple as you can make it so that beginner and casual players won't get bogged down by rules. This game is made for telling fun stories rather than hashing out ability modifiers and consulting charts full of numbers. Havens. This is an important outlet for frequent PC death because it acts as a shared PC that players can fall back on. Since Havens usually come stocked with named NPCs, players who lose a PC can always assume one of these characters from the home base and keep the game experience going, all while still being a part of the shared narrative fabric that's being spun at the table. I would have maybe liked to have seen just a little more mechanical complexity to Havens besides just capacity and defense, but simplicity is the name of the game with Free League most of the time and this is what you get. So yeah, this is a great zombie game. If you're a homebrewer and game design enthusiast, I'm sure you could come up with a few tweaks here and there that would make this game just right for your group, but otherwise I think it's designed for relatively fast and casual play with a slim option for more extended campaigns as long as your story can survive the eventual death of every last PC that you started the campaign with, because they are gonna die. Let me know if you've gotten this one to your table. I'd love to hear about your experiences down in the comments and be sure to subscribe to my newsletter and consider supporting my channel on Patreon. Links for everything are down below. Thanks for watching, see ya.